Section 17 of History of Egypt, Volume 2, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Memphite Empire, Part 5. The anomaly of a third pyramid out of proportion to the two others could be explained only on the hypothesis that Mykoneros, having broken with paternal usage, had ignorantly infringed a decree of destiny, a deed for which he was mercilessly punished. He first lost his only daughter. A short time after he learned from an oracle that he had only six more years to remain upon the earth. He enclosed the corpse of his child in a hollow wooden heifer, which he sent to Saïs, where it was honoured with divine worship. He then communicated his reproaches to the god, complaining that his father and uncle, after having closed the temples, forgotten the gods and oppressed mankind, had enjoyed a good life, while he, devout as he was, was so soon about to perish. The oracle answered that it was for this very reason that his days were shortened, for he had not done that which he ought to have done. Egypt had to suffer for a hundred and fifty years, and the two kings, his predecessors, had known this, while he had not. On receiving this answer, Mykerinos, feeling himself condemned, manufactured a number of lamps, lit them every evening at dusk, began to drink and to lead a life of jollity, without ceasing for a moment night and day, wandering by the lakes and in the woods wherever he thought to find an occasion of pleasure. He had planned this in order to convince the oracle of having spoken falsely, and to live twelve years, the nights counting as so many days. Legend places him after Asicus, or Sassicus, a later builder of pyramids, but of a different kind. The latter preferred brick as a building material, except in one place, where he introduced a stone bearing the following inscription. Do not despise me on account of the stone pyramids. I surpass them as much as Zeus the other gods. Because a pole being plunged into a lake and the clay which stuck to it being collected, the brick out of which I was constructed was moulded from it. The virtues of Asicus and Mykerinos helped to counteract the bad impression which Cheops and Kephrin had left behind them. Among the five legislators of Egypt, Asicus stood out as one of the best. He regulated, to minute details, the ceremonies of worship. He invented geometry in the art of observing the heavens. He put forth a law on lending, in which he authorized the borrower to pledge in forfeit the mummy of his father, while the creditor had the right of treating as his own the tomb of the debtor, so that if the debt was not met, the latter could not obtain a resting place for himself or his family, either in his paternal or any other tomb. History knows nothing either of this judicious sovereign or of many other pharaohs of the same type, which the dragomans of the Greek period assiduously enforced upon the respectful attention of travellers. It merely affirms that the example given by Cheops, Kephrin, and Mykerinos were by no means lost in later times. From the beginning of the fourth to the end of the fourteenth dynasty, during more than fifteen hundred years, the construction of pyramids was a common state affair, provided for by the administration, secured by special services. Not only did the pharaohs build them for themselves, but the princes and princesses belonging to the family of the pharaohs constructed theirs, each one according to his resources. Three of the secondary mausoleums are ranged opposite the eastern side of the horizon, three opposite the southern face of the supreme, and everywhere else, near Abusir, at Saqqara, at Dashur, or in the Fayum, the majority of the royal pyramids attracted around them a more or less numerous cortege of pyramids of princely foundation, often debased in shape and faulty in proportion. The materials for them were brought from the Arabian chain. A spur of the latter, projecting in a straight line towards the Nile, as far as the village of Troyu, is nothing but a mass of the finest and whitest limestone. The Egyptians had quarries here from the earliest times. By cutting off the stone in every direction, they lowered the point of this spur for a depth of some hundreds of meters. The appearance of these quarries is almost as astonishing as that of the monuments made out of their material. The extraction of the stone was carried on with a skill and regularity which denoted ages of experience. The tunnels were so made as to exhaust the finest and whitest seams without waste, and the chambers were of an enormous extent. The walls were dressed, the pillars and roofs neatly finished, the passages and doorways made of a regular width, so that the whole presented more the appearance of a subterranean temple than of a place for the extraction of building materials. 
Hastily written graffiti, in red and black ink, preserved the names of workmen, overseers, and engineers, who had labored here at certain dates, calculations of pay or rations, diagrams of interesting details, as well as capitals and shafts of columns, which were shaped out on the spot to reduce their weight for transport. Here and there true official stelas are to be found set apart in a suitable place, recording that after a long interruption such or such an illustrious sovereign had resumed the excavations, and opened fresh chambers. Alabaster was met with not far from here in the Wadi Garai. The pharaohs of very early times established a regular colony here, in the very middle of the desert, to cut the material into small blocks for transport. A strongly built dam, thrown across the valley, served to store up the winter and spring rains, and formed a pond whence the workers could always supply themselves with water. Cheops and his successors drew their alabaster from Hatnubu, in the neighborhood of Hermopolis, their granite from Syene, their diorite and other hard rocks, the favorite material for their sarcophagi, from the volcanic valleys which separate the Nile from the Red Sea, especially from the Wadi Hamamat. As these were the only materials of which the quantity required could not be determined in advance, and which had to be brought from a distance, every king was accustomed to send the principal persons of his court to the quarries of Upper Egypt, and the rapidity with which they brought back the stone constituted a high claim on the favor of their master. If the building was to be of brick, the bricks were made on the spot, in the plain at the foot of the hills. If it was to be a limestone structure, the neighboring parts of the plateau furnished the rough material in abundance. For the construction of chambers and for casing walls, the rose granite of Elephantine and the limestone of Troyu were commonly employed, but they were spared the labor of procuring these specially for the occasion. The city of the White Wall had always at hand a supply of them in its stores, and they might be drawn upon freely for public buildings, and consequently for the royal tomb. The blocks chosen from this reserve, and conveyed in boats close under the mountainside, were drawn up slightly inclined causeways by oxen to the place selected by the architect. The internal arrangements, the length of the passages and the height of the pyramids, varied much. The least of them had a height of some thirty-three feet merely. As it is difficult to determine the motives which influenced the pharaohs in building them of different sizes, some writers have thought that the mass of each increased in proportion to the time bestowed upon its construction, that is to say, the length of each reign. As soon as a prince mounted the throne, he would probably begin by roughly sketching out a pyramid sufficiently capacious to contain the essential elements of the tomb. He would then, from year to year, have added fresh layers to the original nucleus, until the day of his death put an end forever to the growth of the monument. This hypothesis is not borne out by facts. Such a small pyramid as that of Saqqara belonged to a pharaoh who reigned thirty years, while the horizon of Giza is the work of Cheops, whose rule lasted only twenty-three years. The plan of each pyramid was arranged once for all by the architect, according to the instructions he had received, and the resources at his command. Once set on foot, the work was continued until its completion, without addition or diminution, unless something unforeseen occurred. The pyramids, like the mastabas, ought to present their faces to the four cardinal points, but owing to unskillfulness or negligence, the majority of them are not very accurately orientated, and several of them very sensibly from the true north. The great pyramid of Saqqara does not describe a perfect square at its base, but is an oblong rectangle, with its longest sides east and west. It is stepped, that is to say, the six sloping-sided cubes of which it is composed are placed one upon another so as to form a series of treads and risers, the former being about two yards wide and the latter of unequal heights. The highest of the stone pyramids of Dashur makes at its lower part an angle of fifty-four degrees forty-one minutes with the horizon, but at half its height the angle becomes suddenly more acute, and is reduced to forty-two degrees fifty-nine minutes. It reminds one of a mastaba with a sort of huge attic on the top. Each of these monuments had its enclosing wall, its chapel, and its college of priests, who performed there for ages sacred rites in honor of the deceased prince, while its property in Mortmain was administered by the chief of the priests of the double. Each one received a name, such as the fresh, the beautiful, the divine in its places, which conferred upon it a personality, and as it were a living soul. 
These pyramids formed to the west of the white wall a long, serrated line whose extremities were lost towards the south and north in the distant horizon. Pharaoh could see them from the terraces of his palace, from the gardens of his villa, and from every point in the plain in which he might reside between Heliopolis and Medum, as a constant reminder of the lot which awaited him in spite of his divine origin. The people, awed and inspired by the number of them, and by the variety of their form and appearance, were accustomed to tell stories of them one to another, in which the supernatural played a predominant part. They were able to estimate within a few ounces the heaps of gold and silver, the jewels and precious stones which adorned the royal mummies, or filled the sepulchral chambers. They were acquainted with every precaution taken by the architects to ensure the safety of all these riches from robbers, and were convinced that magic had added to such safeguards the more effective protection of talismans and genii. There was no pyramid so insignificant that it had not its mysterious protectors, associated with some amulet, in most cases with a statue, animated by the double of the founder. The Arabs of today are still well acquainted with these protectors, and possess a traditional respect for them. The great pyramid concealed a black and white image, seated on a throne and invested with the kingly scepter. He who looked upon this statue heard a terrible noise proceeding from it, which almost caused his heart to stop beating, and he who heard this noise would die. An image of rose-colored granite watched over the pyramid of Kephron, standing upright, a scepter in its hand and the euros on its brow. Which serpent threw himself upon him who approached it, coiled itself around his neck, and killed him? A sorcerer had invested these protectors of the ancient pharaohs with their powers, but another equally potent magician could elude their vigilance, paralyze their energies, if not forever, at least for a sufficient length of time to ferret out the treasure and rifle the mummy. The cupidity of the fellahin, highly inflamed by the stories which they were accustomed to hear, gained the mastery over their terror, and emboldened them to risk their lives in these well-guarded tombs. How many pyramids had been already rifled at the beginning of the Second Theban Empire? The Fourth Dynasty had become extinct in the person of Shopsiska, the successor and probably the son of Mykerinos. The learned of the time of Ramses II regarded the family which replaced this dynasty as merely a secondary branch of the line of Snofru, raised to power by the capricious laws which settled hereditary questions. Nothing on the contemporary monuments, it is true, gives indication of a violent change attended by civil war, or resulting from a revolution at court. The construction and decoration of the tombs continued without interruption and without indication of haste. The sons-in-law of Shopsipska and of Mykerinos, their daughters and grandchildren, possess under the new kings the same favor, the same property, the same privileges, which they had enjoyed previously. End of section 17. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.